I think the story of Mike Oldfield is probably one of the most extraordinary sagas in all of rock music. I first met him when he was about 16. At the time, I was running a discount mail order record shop and Mike was trying to get some interest in a tape of some music he'd put together. I knew him only as a top class guitarist who'd been on the road with musicians like Kevin Ayers, but apparently he'd been trying to persuade someone to believe in his musical ideas for years. We were all a bit broke at Virgin at that time, but we offered him the use of our sound studio, which was and is uh, in a rather grand house near Oxford called The Manor, and disappeared to work on his tapes. Twelve months later, uh, we took the tapes to Midem, which is a terrible big international music sales conference in the south of France, in the hope of getting things off the ground. Fairly predictably, we could get no interest in them. One, one record company said there was a load of self-indulgent rubbish, and, and uh, they definitely wouldn't be interested. Another record company said that if they slapped a few vocals on it, they would give us $20,000. And um, you know, we, you know, we said that we weren't that desperate. And um, in any case, we came back to England, having got no interest from outside England at all. Anything I can do is muck up his sound. Eventually, uh, we decided there was nothing for it but to release the record ourselves, which we did, giving it the number B two thousand and one. And then we thought that to launch the record, we would organise a concert of the music. But there was just one problem: on the record, there are some forty to fifty instruments. Mike had played nearly all of these himself. And the music, Tubular Bells, with almost no promotion, began to sell faster than we could make copies of it. In fact, the sales were staggering. In England, it went straight into the charts, where it's been ever since. During the first six months alone... I don't know, his, his album sold about... Uh, it will have sold about five million albums by the end of the year, worldwide. And in, in England alone, a million, a million albums. <laughs> promoting the record in America, Australia, or wherever. But again, there was just one problem. Mike had disappeared. As a result of the concert, it had something of a breakdown and had vanished to his parents' house, apparently to build a duck pond. So we were faced with the nightmare of a number one artist who would not be interviewed, who would not play in public, who would not travel, who just wanted to sit at home and compose. idea where he gets his musical ideas from, although he learned a lot from a composer he met with Kevin Ayers called David Bedford, who gave him records of Delius and Vaughan Williams. All his music is constructed with infinite care. He records each tiny segment himself on a multi-track tape recorder. On Tubular Bells, for instance, he overdubbed, that is, re-recorded, some 10,000 little sections. And on Omidorn, his third piece, he overdubbed so many times that he completely wore out the tape, as well as himself, and had to start again. The mixer that he's now got, and in which he's recorded the music for his new space movie, has given him slightly greater freedom. You start with a raw sound, straight into the mixer, equalise that. Maybe so it's a lot brighter. A bit brighter. Yeah, 
Perhaps a repeat echo on it. Just one repeat. Speed that one up. And also the volume of the repeat. So the volume of the repeat's louder than the first note. Mike writes out a score, or normally writes out a score, just like any other composer. And then having recorded the different elements of his music, he just mixes them all together. One piece, which maybe lasts for 40 to 45 minutes, can take him as long as a year. Sounds like a very hoarse little animal. A sore throat. Tremolo guitar. There's organ tune, the bass, synthesizer bass. Bass guitar going boom, 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 boom. And there's a gong blast there. Gong, sleigh bells and bell tree. Mandolin starts here, but it's got rubbed off. He works more or less entirely on his own, oh, in isolation down. and in peace. Next thing that happens, all this lot start timpani. Loads of synthesizers, a rattle, claves. Three electric guitars and synthesizers, six of them all going whizz, 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 at different times. There's that bit. It should be a dock rattle. I think that got rubbed off too. And yet he's managed to achieve great success in a medium which everyone seems still to think depends on things like oversell and packaging and product and promotion. Much of it does, of course. Most of popular music is like that. The medium really is the message. Could be a gong here from Bosch. No, it's not there either. But fortunately, there are a few exceptions. There are musicians working around. today in the rock medium who have chosen pop or rock or whatever you want to call it as the best language, the language that speaks to the most people to say what they want to say. Sustained guitar is a double speed guitar recorded half speed so that when it's speeded it up, it's. And these are doing so without compromising their musical standards, without getting involved in all those things which everyone expects as so-called pop stars. With Mike, for instance, uh, you know, I mean, he very rarely rings up and, you know, says, you know, how's sales going? About, I mean, I've never known him ringing up and asking how sales are going or, you know, um, uh, I mean, he's never interested in, in reviews or, or features or anything about himself. Um, I mean, I think that you know there are some there are some musicians like Elton John who, um, who, you know, are into it in a in a in a, in a business way, you know, and uh, into projecting you know a whole image, uh, which Mike happens not to be. Um, he's also you know like myself, he's not a particularly articulate speaker, and, and he knows what he's good at, and he's, he knows what he's not good at, and I mean he feels that you know he hasn't got a lot to say verbally. I mean he feels he has got a lot to say musically. <laughs> may not be as yet that sophisticated but it's an important beginning anyway I believe that a composer such as Mike Oldfield is among the best hopes we have for contemporary popular music that's the second one and they both fit together beautifully what, what about it, didn't you like? What, the pop business? Yeah. Oh, I mean... It's a bit silly, isn't it? <laughs> I think it is. Don't really get involved in it. What sort of things? What sort of things are silly? Well... <clears throat> um, I can't pretend at all. Unless I'm very drunk, then I don't pretend. I just make an exhibition of myself. But it, I speak, most of it is making an exhibition of yourself, isn't it? I'd rather just do it here. 
I think these young men have done more to harm our youth than any young people that have come around during the last generation, or during the last several generations, because people have followed their lifestyle, uh, the way they dress, the way they look, uh, which has made a sloppy, uh, dirty-looking generation, and I think we're beginning to move out of that. <laughs>